So, um, this young gentleman here is now Dr. Lewis Bork. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. And Lewis has been one of our preservation fellows. It's a program that uh, Archaeology uh, Southwest, it's actually an endowed program that we are able, every three years, we are able to bring in a new preservation fellow. They spend those three years working on a, a joint project with us where uh, they're contributing to our goals in preservation archaeology, and they're coming in as advanced doctoral candidates. So. Uh, it's a partnership with their uh, university, and Lewis ha has his master's degree from University of New, New Mexico, but is over here at the University of Arizona for his recently completed PhD. It, it is actually through Arizona for my master's, too. Oh. <laughs> what were you doing in... Uh, my right. bachelor's, was that... Uh, he'll know? explain some bio <laughs> bi biography here. Um, but Lewis has been an absolutely wonderful uh, partner at, at Archaeology Southwest, and we're extremely happy that he uh, has completed the, the, the program. And he's <laughs> wrapping up some of the things that, uh, from the field work that he did on our Edge of Salado grant. And tonight is going to be talking to you about a consent and descent in deep time, the title of his talk. And when we get 25 or 30 minutes into it, he'll wrap things up and we'll have an opportunity to ask questions. I'll bring the microphone around to you. So hold questions until then and we'll have a good conversation with Lewis. And thank you, Lewis. <laughs> thank you, Bill. You can tell I get a, a bit long winded sometimes because Bill just gave me a time limit right there. So real, real nicely. <laughs> um, but so, uh, yeah, so tonight we're going to be talking uh, briefly about. Uh, some archaeological culture history, I guess. So I'm just going to go over some some areas and kind of contextualize some of the the stuff we're going to be talking about, and then I'm going to try and draw it in, uh, and hopefully, in not too much of a muddled mess, into the the big questions that we uh, sort of wanted to do for, uh, or that Archaeology Southwest wanted to do for this season of uh, the Arche archaeology cafes, and these are the the so what's like why why bother with this research? That's how at least how I interpret it. So, so what? So we'll, uh, we'll get into some of the so what. But before I do that, I actually want to ask uh, the crowd a couple of questions, really just one question, I guess. Um, and I, I know there are some professional archaeologists in here tonight, uh, so I'd appreciate if you guys didn't raise your hands. <laughs> um, because I have a feeling you're going to tell me the site you work on is the site that I'm asking about. Uh, but what I would like to do is just to get a couple of people to raise their hands and tell me what they think the most important sites are in the Southwest, in the greater Southwest. Chaco Canyon, okay. I'm going to write them down up here, and we'll get back to them at some point. Or not. Maybe I'm just sidetracking us. Jay. Point of Pines, okay. Other, any other hands? Pocky Andy. Pocky Man. All right. Thank you, Andy. Oh, I'm going to spell this wrong. There we go. Also Casas Grandes. Any others? One more. Snake Town. All right. Yes. Okay. So we'll, we'll come back to these at some point or not. I may have just tricked you all. You, you don't know what the joke is. Only I do. <laughs> um, so we're going to move forward, and I'll, I'll explain uh, what, I was, what I'm getting at there in, in about uh, uh, 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but first, we're going to go through a very brief rundown of Hoakam archaeology. And this is super brief, uh, so I apologize for the speed that this will happen at. Um, so if you look at your handouts that you have, in the, on the second page, or the third page, I guess, on the bottom here, you can kind of track along with this uh, blue line that, that moves up and down uh, for, what I'm, for what I'm talking about to some level. Uh, so for the Hohokam period, uh, there's canal irrigation, or even, I guess, prior to the Hohokam period, canal irrigation was happening through southern Arizona uh, 
for a very long time prior to what we, we now call Hohokam. And the Hohokam sequence really begins uh, with the long-term process of village settlement by, by kin groups and lineages, uh, and then other types of, of corporate groups, so other types of social groups. Uh, and then about this time we get plaza construction too. And by uh, 8800, uh, about 750 on this thing that you're looking at, you start to see raised bank ball courts uh, built throughout the, the Hohokam world. And these spread out throughout the, the entire world, and we end up with a large number of them. Um, around this time, you get a new style of decorative red on buff and brown ceramics being made. And uh, uh, Paul and Susie Fish, don't yell at me for how fast I'm going through this. Um, and along with the uh, advent of, of these ball courts, you get a cultural fluorescence uh, that, that has public participatory ceremonies sort of embedded within it. By about 80, 1100, you start to see population aggregation, so people are coming together into larger communities than they were before. And oftentimes they're uh, moving into old communities, uh, but some like, uh, such as what we see up at Pueblo Grande. Um, and sometimes they're, they're moving into new ones, uh, like up in the Marana area where Paul and Susie worked at. Um, this aggregation and population growth, so the people coming together and, and, uh, and uh, the population increasing continues through AD 1200s. And it starts to level off when residential compound mounds, uh, uh, compounds appear. And these are essentially, at, at prior to this, people are living in pit houses. And by the, the compound period, there are these adobe structures that have individual houses uh, or within them or individual buildings, but they're surrounded by a, a, an adobe compound wall. From 1200 to 1300, you get the construction of platform mounds that spreads throughout the Hohokam world. And, and some of these, they start out pretty small, and then they get massive, and then uh, towards the end of the sequence, they get pretty small again. Um, and you can, if you turn back to the front of your page, you can actually, there's a picture of uh, Pueblo Grande on the upper, my right, I guess that would be your left. And, and for scale, this is a, a representation of a later period when people are living uh, on top of these. And, and this is a period that, it's commonly considered to be one of the most hierarchically organized uh, period in, in the Hoakam region up to this point. And it's partially, if not completely, this hierarchy is partially, if not completely, a product of control of religious knowledge by elites. And the argument is that uh, these compound, uh, or these uh, platform mounds or uh, ritual or religious ceremonies are occurring on top of them and, and the access to those ceremonies is restricted. Uh, but an important point is the knowledge for how to carry out these ceremonies is also restricted. All right, so uh, that was really fast for a very long period of time. But uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is right about when these platform mounds start to show up, right around the 1200s, into the, the mid-1200s, into the 1300s, you get a movement of people from up north, uh, from up in the Cayenta and Tucson area. And that's uh, so their... Northern Arizona basically moving into uh, many parts in central and southern Arizona. And, uh, and that's partially almost, uh, I guess that's uh, the large chunk of the Edge of Salado thing that Bill had talked about was trying to figure out what's happening uh, with this group of people that had moved here um, and how they're interacting with their neighbors. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, this migrant group who left their homeland during a, a crisis if you want to read more about that, there's a, there's a whole lot of literature up on the Archaeology Southwest website to, to find out exactly what's going on with that. Um, but there's a small group of people that move throughout southern Arizona. And uh, as they begin to arrive, they're possibly following trade routes. They're moving in and living next to really socially distant uh, local populations, host populations. And in some areas, like in the San Pedro, uh, just west of Tucson, and this is a group, these are uh, areas where it seems to, these uh, migrants seem to have been viewed with some form of, uh, uh, as some form of threat. There isn't a lot of evidence of physical violence, but there's a lot of evidence of, I, th I think, what you could call maybe structural violence. There's people really concerned for their, their safety. Uh, you can think of it in terms of building a giant wall along the south of uh, Arizona. They, uh, but these, these migrants, these Cayenta and Tucson migrants, have a really developed sense of identity. And this uh, sense of identity continues through after their migration. It's um, 
and it, it continues and is tied together through all these dispersed groups of, of people. Eventually what happens is uh, there's an, an immigrant initiated uh, ideology that uh, Patty Crown has called the Southwest Regional Cult and, and this is uh, what we often refer to as Salado and it's this, this package of uh, fertility symbolism built into ceramic vessels uh, which are also on the first page here and there's a box of sherds in the background which is most of what my work is built on um, and not these pretty pots in the foreground. Um, but there's a lot of imagery on these that people have argued uh, fairly convincingly that's, that relates to uh, fertility symbolism. The pots themselves seem to have been uh, based on arguments that a number of archaeologists have made, including uh, Barbara Mills and Patty Crown, have been, were used in, in ritual uh, large-scale uh, participatory feasting ceremonies. Um, so right there, just kind of think about this difference between who is interacting in, in this religious uh, ceremony with the, in the Salado cult versus who's interacting in, in these religious ceremonies with the Hohokam. But the Salado ideology uh, basically ended up crossing this migrant local boundary and it, it fused migrants and locals together into this larger um, network uh, where, where within a, a generation or two, a couple generations, it became very difficult to distinguish uh, migrants from uh, from from locals, and so what's really interesting here is this this religion that that pops up really uh, is a product of not simply the migrants moving down, but how they're interacting uh, with the Hohokam locals. <coughs> so one of the things that that I did for my dissertation, and that was wrapped up with the Edge of Salado project that Bill was talking about, is I looked at these Salado ceramics, uh, these beautiful little guys, but really just all of that jumbled box of sherds in the background, um, through a, this idea of uh, when, you're, when you're choosing to drink wine, you're choosing it for a, a specific reason, you're making a choice. Jack, uh, I almost always only see drinking red wine, so there's, there's a reason for that. <laughs> it, it may just be taste, but consumption of material culture is a choice. We're making a choice every time we, we consume something, whether it's food or whether it's the material or like, like our technology. And so the choice, of course, is whether to engage with that material culture or not, whether to use it. Um, but if the material culture is ideologically charged, that means if it's really religiously significant, then that choice actually becomes religiously uh, significant as well. And so you, you can kind of start to query those choices of how people are using uh, religiously significant, or ideologically significant material culture to start to understand what groups are accepting and what groups are refusing and, and a whole other continuum of choices. And, and on the back page, there's this heuristic idea of technology uptake curves. Uh, a lot of big words to basically say this is just a way to look at and, and understand what I'm talking about in terms of figuring out where or how uh, we could determine if ceramics are purposely, or this material culture, this ideologically significant material culture, was purposely rejected or whether it was actively sought out um, or whether people just didn't know about it. So, and one thing I should add too is that this material culture is of course a uh, correlate, it's an analog for human behavior, human, uh, the human experience, human processes. So. Um, all right, so looking at whether people know about Salado, whether they know about the ideology, the religion, and whether they're resisting it, or actively seeking it out, or whether they just don't know about it, leads to um, a model, which is this confusing uh, series of maps on the second page. Um, and I apologize for the size, I didn't want to print out uh, six of these. so. What, what you end up seeing though is there's this time series, right? It starts at AD 1200 and it goes through uh, AD 1450 to 1500. And in the 1250 to 1450 period, these larger dots, and you can see the ones that are colored blue and purple are the ones uh, primarily that I'm, uh, we're looking at. And those are the ones where it's 50% or more Salado ceramics. So that was just a rough cutoff that I made to draw those black lines around to say this is where Salado has become uh, embedded within uh, the, the, the religion is, or the ideology has become embedded within that community. 
And you can see that it starts out pretty small, and then over the next 100 years, it spreads pretty rapidly. And by AD 1400 and 1450, as sites are becoming, uh, all those other dots on the landscape are, are sites that are inhabited at this time period that, that don't have Salado polychrome. And by 1400 to 1450, you can see that, uh, in, at least in the, for definitely within the southern southwest, the vast majority of sites are primarily Salado uh, polychromes. And what we're looking at, there's an orange line on there too, and that's this uh, distribution of where you would expect material technology to be transmitted if there's uh, just a functional choice that people are making. There's not a lot of baggage associated with it, so like the transmission of new farming technologies, things like that. And areas where uh, Salado are that are outside of those orange lines are areas where people, I'm, I have argued in, in, in my work, have actively sought out uh, this ideology and areas within those orange lines where you don't see it are areas where people have actively uh, resisted the, the spread of Salado uh, and, and that sounds like it's a contagion and it, it's it I'll get to it in a little bit because I kind of think it is a bit of a contagion, but but possibly a good kind um, So what you see then are areas of contestation versus non-contestation. So essentially areas of success for Salado, uh, the non-contestation, and then areas where Salado failed to, to spread, to thrive, and that's the areas where it was contested. And that, that gets us to the ability to actually tr start to understand how the, a, a message that may have been behind the Salado ideology, besides just that, of fertility, and this is where I started to think about Salado more as a social movement and not simply as a religion. So it'd be more like a religious social movement. Because where it's successful and where it's not successful has little to do strictly with religious uh, situations in those regions, and it has a lot to do with the political uh, situation in those regions. And in the Southwest, that's not saying a whole lot of different stuff because religion and politics are incredibly embedded here. I think in, in, in almost all areas through, through most times. But you start to see three main groups. And one is that there's resistors who are within a hierarchical ideology. And you can think of that as uh, the people in the platform on society in the Tucson Basin, who early on don't have a lot of the Salado polychromes. And then you have resistors within an egalitarian ideology. And uh, you, you see that in um, the southern San Pedro Valley, like in the Baba Kamari. Uh, region where Ameren's done a lot of work, and then uh, up north, you notice that Salado has a lot of trouble spreading north, right? And then you also have early adopters, and this is uh, something that we see in the Sulphur Springs Valley and San Bernardino Valley that a lot of people in here helped, uh, helped Archaeology Southwest and myself excavate at. Um, anyway, so what, when, when we look at it in that way, what we can, we can see is that the Salado ideology spreads very effectively and becomes prominent in areas that were hierarchical. So it spreads in the edge of the Casas Grandes uh, Pacime area, which is a very hierarchical, uh, vertically oriented group. And it spreads very effectively through a lot of the platform mound areas, the edges of the platform mound areas at least. And so Salado itself seems to be this populist, non-hierarchical, horizontally organized uh, social movement. So it's uh, the difference between being organized I'm gonna draw networks because I think of everything relationally now and uh, that's partially Barbara Mills's fault and partially because it works really well. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, a hierarchical network, right? And the central node is kind of controlling the information. So information gets distributed out this way. And you can have a, an alternative to that. There's some rock and roll going on too, I like that, all right. Um, where you get a very decentralized network where ties are determined like that, and information spreads real easily through there. There's no one really controlling that spread of information. So hierarchical versus, or vertical organization versus horizontal organization. And so for instance, uh, and I guess this will be repeating myself a little bit, but in the, the Tucson Basin, the Hohokam area, the Platform Island Society would be the uh, vertically oriented group, and the Salado, I'm arguing, are a horizontally organized uh, religious social movement, and in fact their success is because what they're doing is actually purposely contesting these hierarchical situations. So it's contesting hierarchical power structures that limits people's, people's power, people's power to do. 
And uh, there's been a lot of researchers who've looked at transitions from the Hohokam pre-classic, the ball court period, into the, into the classic period, and, and they see that sort of transition of restricting people's ability to participate in the religion happen. And so Salado, I'm arguing, is, is essentially undoing that. It's, it's giving people their, their power back to do, to, to participate in their, their religious lives again, to have control of that. So that message appears to be center, centered around reclaiming religious and therefore political power. You see things that make this a little bit more difficult to, uh, maybe not more difficult to argue with, but you th see this message start to change in, in different areas, and it changes in the Phoenix Basin in, in an interesting way uh, in which the, the symbolism for Salado gets co-opted uh, by elites. It seems to, we need a lot more research up there, but in the Cowdy Mountains out west where the Edge of Salado project also excavated with a number of people in this room, uh, you see that message of horizontal organization actually impact the platform mound society in a way that where you see a lot of small platform mounds that are easily accessible by a number of people. So there's, there's, uh, these groups are actually counter-mobilizing is, is one way to, to think about it and taking the uh, effective message of, of this group that's, that's uh, doing a very good job of basically stripping power from them and to try and re uh, retain some of that power. And so this is like a uh, uh, anthropologist and, and social scientist call this uh, dialogic. It means it's you're saying something, I'm saying something, and we through the course of that conversation, things change basically, right? So conclusions of that rapid uh, movement through a, a large chunk of my my research is that Salado ideology was born from the interaction of locals and migrants. It was horizontally organized. It was a popular social movement aimed at contesting hierarchical power structures. Um, and it seems to be centered around reclaiming religious and political power. Uh, let's see. And there's also variations in regional reactions to the Salado ideology that help us underscore uh, this message of what this, or the social movement's message. And that takes us to this point of so what? You know, why, why bother looking at this stuff? What kind of impact does it have on the, on the modern world? And, and so I'm gonna go through three things that I, I, I th three ways that I think it's impactful. And one of which is just generally on modern research into contentious politics and social movements. Um, and these are, this is uh, an area where people have been working, that people have been working on for about 150 years. So in, in the terms of uh, Western social research, it's got pretty deep time depth, but Basically, the, the general argument is that social movements really didn't exist before the 1800s. And uh, at that point, how people interacted with uh, elites changed dramatically as labor classes started to fight for uh, better labor conditions, more money, things like that. And through time, you get all these different variations in how people are researching social movements. But then something happens in the 60s. <laughs> across the world and everyone uh, sort of starts to reevaluate what, what they've been talking about. I almost said bleep. <laughs> what they've been bleeping talking about. Because uh, what you start to see is that there are social movements that are, uh, that are arising that aren't based on economic reasons. They're based on ideological uh, problems. And, and we see that still today, the, the, this whole idea of uh, or this whole, uh, the success of the, the gay and the LGBTQ movement is, is, is not one that's simply based on uh, an economic, it doesn't have an economic foundation, or it, it's more about uh, personal perceptions and, and identity politics. And that's really important, because those are a lot harder to see archeologically uh, than something that would be built around uh, our food resources or any other type of economic uh, system. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. And so one of the things that I think uh, we, can, we can take from, from how social movement theory has looked at these things through time and, and how archeologists have been applying them is, is to reinvigorate and reanalyze periods in the past that we've actually uh, often, as archeologists, we've called periods of collapse or periods of disaggregation or periods of dispersal because a lot of these things have been primarily argued to be fundamentally based around uh, environmental collapse and economic decline. And uh, 
when we start to think about them as periods in which people may be making purposeful choices for how to reorganize, then they start to look a lot di more different. They always start to look uh, as if there's contestations of, of privilege uh, and, and elites. Okay, so again, so what? So that's uh, maybe not a, a big deal for, for everybody, but for a lot of people, this idea of or for me, maybe I should say, not a lot of people, the exact opposite of a lot of people, uh, this idea of, of uh, ideological or, or identity politics social movements versus economic social movements is really important because when we start to look at periods of change through, through time through in archaeology, and in particular in the Southwest, we start to see that a lot, of, or I start to, uh, I, I argue that a lot of these periods of, of change could have fundamentally a, a basis in which there's a social movement driving them. And we know nowadays that social movements are one of the primary drivers of historical change. And the, the bigger argument, I think, is that we need to go back into time and start to say, well, look, these movements based on identity politics may have been as important in the past as they are now. People cared about things they, they fervently believed in just as much as they, they care about those things now. And it wasn't simply about whether the crop came in well this year. And I'm essentializing that a little bit, but. So that's one. Two, we get to this other idea of querying progress, right? Uh, so increases, the, the kind of idea about this is that increases in, in hierarchy and inequality are what leads to complex societies. They're what leads to states. They're what leads to us having uh, Android phones and, and, uh, and uh, um, the ability to record our, our talks. Um, but this transition, so, so there's this, kind of idea that the transition from horizontal organization from like egalitarian hunter-gatherer tribes to vertical organization is progress. Now, this has been attacked and contradicted and argued against in anthropology and sociology and a lot of the social sciences for a very long time. No one would agree with me when I say that. Everyone would tell me that I'm, I'm totally wrong and, and they're right. But the problem is that a lot of times this view of, uh, of that transition as progress is, is implicit and it's unintended. We don't always know that we have those types of, of biases. And it, it really impacts how we look at uh, history and how we look at the archeological record and what we protect, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so in addition to that, a lot of these horizontal reorganizations are often looked at negatively. They're often looked at as regression or as failures. Um, so the keywords here, of course, are fail and progress, fail and advance. And uh, if w I, I think a lot of times we don't think about them too much because we're, we're looking at these questions from within a state context already. We're already in a very vertically oriented uh, hierarchical situation. We're already entrenched in, in hierarchy. But if we flip that, we can start to ask some interesting questions. We can ask, why did people in the North American Southwest succeed? at limiting hierarchy, instead of why did they fail to get states like the rest of the world did. Um, Norm Yaffe has an old law, and it's basically that if you have to ask uh, if this culture is a state, then it's not a state. And I, I don't know if that's the right question. I think the better question is to ask, why, why bother looking for states? Why not try and figure out what, what happened to limit the ability for these groups to move into states? And the Southwest actually gives us a really nice uh, area to understand these types of entrenched um, limitations on the, uh, uh, the accumulation of, of power. Um, all right, so see if I can figure out where I'm at here. Okay, but so, and again, this is, I'm, I'm really probably hitting this hammer on the nail a bit too much, but a lot of this is built on the fact that uh, this kind of implicit understanding we have that hunter-gatherers are easily egalitarian. Like, it's, it's not any effort for humans to exist within an egalitarian uh, society. And if anyone has kids, especially toddlers, they know that that is not even remotely the case because they fight about everything being fair constantly. It's uh, a really difficult process to make that happen. Um, but it's even more difficult to make decisions in an egalitarian manner in a group, for instance, of this size. And so... When you're making decisions in this group, you really only have, you have to have very few social institutions in place to make those decisions happen. When you're making decisions in a group like this, you have to have incredibly complex uh, social institutions in place to, to make those decisions go through. So 
it's not effortless, I guess, for, for these horizontal organizations to exist. So there's this transition that happens uh, from egalitarian to, to, to vertical. And, and the idea is to let, we need to revisit whether this is uh, not necessarily a good thing, I don't want to do value judgments, uh, but whether it's easy or not easy. And, and I think uh, looking at social movements that are horizontally organized through time gives us the ability to do that. And there's a lot of background research now that's looking at uh, humans actually starting out as hierarchical and, and having to Im Im embed social institutions for egalitarianism, but that's a whole other talk. <laughs> All right, so the third thing that I think this does is it, uh, and, and I, I, I've I maybe less than hinted at this already, but it really, I think, helps to review, uh, reveal, and I'm, I'm putting myself into this, this isn't me preaching to anybody, uh, it helps to reveal our status bias, our, our bias towards uh, these vertically oriented hierarchical societies. Um, and in and, and the Southwest, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so in, in treating these states as positive ends uh, towards a progressive arc. Um, but we also deny that this is, this is the case. Uh, but anyway, so I think when we start to re-examine these periods of dissolution and, and reorganization into horizontal periods, as purposeful and, and complex, we, we can start to question a lot of other values that we have. And so I'm gonna read you guys a list, and I'll see if you can tell me what this list is. And it's from the United States, I'll say that. <laughs> uh, so Mesa Verde National Park, Independence Hall, Cahokia Mound State Historic Park, La Fortaleza and San Juan National Historic Park in Puerto Rico, Statue of Liberty, Chaco Canyon, Monticello, Taos Pueblo, the Monumental Earthworks of Poverty Point, and San Antonio Missions. Yeah, they're all UNESCO sites, right? So what do all of those UNESCO sites, all except for one, the French guy gets it. <laughs> all except for one, what do all those sites except for one have in common? They're all hierarchical. Yeah, Poverty Point is the one exception, and that's just crazy town. Like, Poverty Point is, is uh, if you guys don't know about Poverty Point, get online and, and prepare to lose a year of your life because it's one of the most interesting places in the U.S. outside of the Southwest. <laughs> but, so this is UNESCO. This is the world, this is United Nations uh, Committee deciding what sites are worth protecting uh, in, in the United States. And they're all... Uh, sites that are, are, are essentially paradigms of, of states, and I'm also using, uh, in terms of uh, Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, I'm using state as an analog for vertically uh, oriented hierarchy, place where, where elites have, have control, and Mesa Verde, it's uh, control of re uh, religious knowledge. So in many ways, what we're doing is participating in, under in undertaking as, as heritage professionals, that's actually whitewashing human history in a way that, into one of elites versus non-elites. And so we're systematically removing alternative forms of organization and, uh, and power um, from, from the, the record if, if we continue in that particular direction. So as I, uh, as I had said to my friend Shane Miller about a, an article I wanted to write in the next couple of years, it's uh, our biases are showing, brah. So it's, it's uh, it, and, and this is, I think this is incredibly important. And I, I think you guys know the point I was getting at with these two when we start talking about the really significant sites in the Southwest and everyone who gave me these, you're not wrong. They are all very significant sites. And, but, uh, but also, we also need to remember that a lot of these dispersed communities of pit house villages and uh, disaggregated groups, people just spread across the landscape are doing that oftentimes for a very specific reason, and they're uh, as important as places like Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde. And luckily, we have uh, contract archaeology in the Southwest that's actually getting us data on those sites, and we have places like uh, Archaeology Southwest and the Archaeological Conservancy who are, who are protecting uh, these, these areas that otherwise wouldn't have protection. So questions? Uh, Bruce Hilpert is always ready to... <laughs> Stir the pot. Here you go, Bruce. And as usual, my question is only partially formed, but that's because nobody else was asking me first. <laughs> but um, you made a comment earlier about economic determinism and how it was only as, after, since the 1800s that people were looking at um, uh, social factors rather than economic factors. I uh, believe you were saying. No, a little bit. Uh, driving. 
it, it was, it's actually, in, in social movement research, it's been since the 1800s that people have been arguing that social movements based on economic factors began. Is it? Oh, so you're saying that they, well, anyway, here's what I'm saying. You bet. I look back, you look at the Reformation, which was both a reaction to a hierarchical religious system. Yes. It was, it then resulted uh, in the spread of people all over to the New World. I mean, they left Germany, they went to yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. Netherlands, et cetera, et cetera. We've been seeing this for you know, hundreds of years. Yeah. It was a, a critical part of the settlement of our country. Um, we saw it in the 1800s with the religious fervor, the westward movement, yeah. again for religious freedom. And we see it today, I think, when, and I don't want to bring politics in this too much, but it seems that there are people that will routinely vote against their economic interests due to their positions on social issues such as abortion or various yeah. things. Yeah. Um, quite contrary to their economic interests in many cases. But it seems like when you have a hierarchical structure, perhaps the ability of that hierarch hierarchical structure to accommodate these uh, more horizontal social movements may determine the future of that hierarchical system. If it, they aren't able to accommodate it by, I mean, and, and what you see in the Salado polychromes spreading into those hierarchical systems, yeah. if they aren't going to uh, accommodate it, then they're gonna lose their own position. Which brings me to something I was thinking as I was thinking about your talk. Have you read, um, and I'm sure you have, but uh, the oral history collected by Julian Hayden in the 1930s when they were doing State Town, it was published as the short, swift time yeah, of yeah. gods on earth. Okay. Of course, yeah. They talk, I mean, as you know, there's a lot of oral history among the mm -hmm. Aladam about overthrowing those platform yes. mound leaders. Yeah. And I find that rather enigmatic, but... Um, do you is are you do you think that this could possibly uh, be related to what led to the collapse of the platform mount system? Yes, I, I. So there's a lot of things to comment on there, Bruce. Uh, well, it was a the, long question. <laughs> so parts one of eight. Uh, no, so I totally agree with you with the Anabaptists. That's a that's a great analogy, and I actually use it in my dissertation. So that's. I think there's analogs with that uh, religious reformation that happens uh, in Europe with uh, some of the reformations that we see happen in, uh, in the Southwest through time. Um, and, and you're absolutely right about people preferencing ideology over economics. And I think we have forgotten that that is uh, a case in, in archaeology. And that's sort of one of the things I'm trying to, to uh, get people to, to think about again. I mean, it's obvious it's not one or the other, it's, it's always this really difficult entwined uh, mess of, of, of economics and ideology that people are balancing when they're going through those things. But, uh, and then for your point, yeah, yes, that's ex what I think happened. <laughs> I, I think Salado was, the, the, I, I, I feel like the, I shouldn't say I feel, I think the data supports the idea that uh, one, of their, one of the large impacts of Salado on southern Arizona, the, the religious landscape, is the contestation and, and, and the, the cause of the eventual collapse of the platform on system. Just a quick follow-up. Um, is it on? Yeah. Um, now, in the Adam oral history, they talk about battles. Do you see that in the archaeological record at they, this late period? So I don't, I haven't, I don't look at that uh, side of things too much, to be quite honest. I don't look at uh, burials and, 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 and whatnot. I think... You know, having come from the nor having done work in the northern Southwest in the Guyana area, which is which is rampant with physical uh, violence, uh, it's a lot different down here in terms of like the degree of violent trauma that you see on skeletal uh, material. So I, I, that's not to say that that violence wasn't happening. I, 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 I suspect it was, but I think it was just a different form than what we we're seeing up, up up north in some of those periods or more spread out through time too.
Uh, yeah. I'd like to turn to your question. You mentioned control of religious knowledge through time. Yeah. One could speak of not so much of control, but a monopoly of expertise in areas deemed critical. And yeah. these days, if I can fast forward to now, please, please do. Exper <laughs> yes, <laughs> expertise is questioned by many. Uh, expertise, I'm an expert in a number of things, uh, religious, yeah. Eastern Orthodox, uh, the contestation and the response of ordinary people gives me, at this point, no power whatsoever. Uh, I would say that, would you see an analogy between the questioning and the undermining of elites, whether it with expertise in climate or in prediction or any number of other areas, has yeah. an analogy with the periods that you're looking at? So. I, I, Qualifying that first, that there's a, I, I want to point out that these social movements aren't necessarily positive in, in orientation. And actually, in my dissertation, the Salado one, I think, is incredibly uh, positive. But the, there's other ones uh, that I talk about that I think are, I don't want to say negative, but they're, uh, they're, they're rough and, and they're full of, uh, instead of people looking to uh, change, they're full of people looking to uh, be more traditional and, and it ends up with a, a much more violent situation. Uh, so yeah, so having said that, I, I, I will say that yeah, there is, uh, I think, analogs in terms of uh, critiques of uh, specialists and, and, and knowledge holders. I think the big difference though is that this is a situation in which it's really wrapped up in, in terms of political power. So it's not just uh, religious power or people's ability to understand what was happening in the climate. It was them leveraging that to also control society. And, and that's, I think, where the big uh, divergence happens between uh, that kind of uh, critique of, of knowledge holders that you're talking about versus uh, what I, I think was happening in, in this particular period in, in the Southwest is that it's, it's something that's more fundamental in terms of changing uh, the structure of power. Of course, of one politics. could also look fast backwarding yes, to yeah. the 80s, 1980s. Yeah. Uh, one could look at the late Soviet period uh -huh. in which there was a monopoly of expertise and power that was undermined by all sorts of elements yeah. giving your lower reading of society. The, okay, I'm not. The, given the, given the egalitarian. Oh, I, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're definitely right. I mean, and that's, I, I, and this, that's all kind of built into these ideas. And, and a lot of that is this early research in the social movement theory really looked at uh, uh, stuff starting off early in Russia and then going through the, the Cold War to try and understand uh, why that was happening. And of, of course, it's all built on Marxism, which is all built on economics and, and uh, uh, material production and class, uh, class war. So there's, there's that f really uh, e extreme focus on, on economics there. But what you're talking about that is happening later are these horizontal movements that are a lot more ideologically focused. And yeah, so you, 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 you do see those. There's a lot of analogs. That, so there's a, I think there's a lot of what happened Right now, what's happened in the last 50 years, 100 years, uh, that we see corollaries with in, in the past. Dr. Dr. Lewis, have you seen any correlation between natural environmental uh, pressures and or <clears throat> external social pressures mm -hmm. uh, that you can correlate to the development of, or the spread of Salado? Is it, did it happen in a vacuum? Did it happen for reasons that you can speculate on so no to both it didn't it didn't happen in a, i mean i have seen those and it so it didn't happen in a vacuum of either environmental pressures or social pressures and uh one of the environmental pressures for salado really was jump started with uh this long-term drought that was happening in the northern southwest and that was one of the reasons that the kayenta moved out of the northern southwest so even the very Proto beginnings of, of where Salado would come from was was started uh, because of environmental factors, and I've done other research where I've actually argued that 
it was a social failure up there as well. You still you see people like uh, or groups are still up there nowadays, like Hopi. So, and so it was ex internal f inability to deal with whatever their reality was versus anything from the outside. Influence. Yeah, they were, they were really, the Kayanta were really internally or, uh, oriented, so they didn't interact a lot with uh, ex external groups, and uh, people like the Hopi did, and, and, and so they were actually able to treat that as like sort of, uh, I've, I've argued like social storage where they can leverage all these connections for, for help through difficult times. The Kayanta didn't have that, so they, uh, I don't want to say resorted, but they ended up migrating out of the region. And it's also one of the reasons I started thinking about why Salado looks so different than early Kayenta stuff, where it's, Salado's inclusive. They're bringing in everything that they possibly can, and whereas early Kayenta stuff was very uh, in exclusive. They, they didn't want a whole lot coming in. Uh, so I, I thought that there was a, a, a failure where they may have reorganized, but there's also uh, social situations happening, and, and that's, I think a lot of it is built into this, the political and social environment they, that was in uh, the Southwest. And, uh, and so that's, when I'm talking about Salado, it's a lot less about the migrants, and it's more about a generation or two later when Salado are essentially now locals, and, and it's, it's a, a couple generations later of, of early migrants and, and locals and how they've combined and created this this new religion. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Jack. To this equation of dynamics in, in the late prehistoric period, yes, Susie. aside from religion, mm -hmm. is what we might call civic affiliation. Yeah. I mean, I think that if we look into Atam um, ethnography, we see that there's something else that's motivating people in terms of leadership and coalescence and who they deem as, as allies and people they want to work with. Yeah. And that's civic. Yeah. Uh, Ruth Underhill tells us that for the Atom, uh, people were very devoted to people in their own villages and in the other villages that yeah. they saw. And we can see this even in the northern southwest where almost everything is attributed to religion in terms of power and organization. Sure. So I think in the southern southwest, we have to balance that against looking solely at leadership and uh, population dynamics rooted in religion, yeah. which of course is there too, yeah. and not so separable. But I think we don't give um, people in the southern southwest particularly, and actually people in the northern southwest, enough credit for having civic principles of organization, yeah. people who feel a strong sense of community. And I think that that kind of organization was undergoing great change in the late prehistoric period. Yeah. And civic leaders could, could um, manipulate you know, religious symbols and religion also in, in service of you know, their own purposes. But I think um, hierarchy and elites are pretty hard to identify in the southern southwest, and particularly in the whole common. I think most of the evidence we have for it, again, is association with civic symbols. I mean, are the platform mounds overtly uh, plugged into the religious symbolism of Salado? Yeah which maybe comes from Mexico, where a lot of other influence or influences in the southern southwest are originating. Yeah, maybe. So, you know, I, I think your models are very interesting, but I would also like to see them incorporate this other kind of organizational force yeah. that I think we have good evidence for with the whole calm. I, and I'm going to interrupt you and just tell you I agree. And that's actually part of what I'm trying to do is, is demonstrate yeah. that this isn't simply about religion. It's, it's about these other organizing principles. And we can actually get at what those underlying organizing principles are by understanding where Salado is effective and where it's not effective. And so I, I'm 100% with you. That whole idea of, of civic mindedness is about this uh, horizontally organized uh, perception of how society should function. Fortunately, we anthropologize lot of it. 
and I, Susie, segments I can't, of society. I, I didn't okay. hear any of that, Susie. Yeah. It cut out. <laughs> to say that I think you know there's there's something else going on here that we have to really take into account. Yeah, no, I agree, hundred percent. So you kind of got to this a second ago with a different question, but I was just wondering, how quickly did this so a lot of tradition develop? I mean, you have in your maps here, you know, there's a couple hundred year period, and you said that this religion at least starts with some of these Kayenta and Tusian migrants, but how did it come in? You think as like a hardline kind of ideology, or was it? How did it develop? A little. Just a little more info would be great. Yeah, so that's uh, so it, it developed down south. It didn't come in with the the kind of migrants. And actually, the pottery they're making when they first moved down here is just pretty much replications of of uh, pottery they're making up north, but on local materials. And the earliest Salado uh, ceramic is this Pinto polychrome, and that doesn't seem to be quite as uh, ideologically charged as the later ones. So it's really with the arrival of Gila. Uh, in the late 1200s that, that it really kind of fluoresces. And that, that's, I think, when you're getting uh, this interaction between the, the migrants and the locals in terms of what is important and what isn't important in terms of uh, using this idea of uh, lim limitations of power to do that, that uh, we have pretty good evidence of happening in the classic period. Uh, Aaron Wright just had a really good study on, on rock art that showed uh, public participatory ritual occurring on a regular basis in the rock art record through the pre-classic. And the classic period, there's like this shut off uh, where it's like someone took control of religious practice and the people weren't generally able to practice in it anymore. And I think Salado is sort of a reaction to that cut off, that power to do basically being removed from the average member of society and being uh, um, aggregated within uh, a few people. But it happened rapidly here. <laughs> Thanks. One more question? I guess not. Thank you very much, Lewis. Thank you, guys. Thank you.